Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar. My name is Aaron Eberhard, and I'm the multi-axis and homemaking product owner over here at CNC Software, makers of Mastercam. And the focus of this webinar is focusing on solving problems by using automatic tilting and how we could get faster and more efficient toolpaths out of our multi-axis suite by relying on that collision control strategy. That being said, let's jump in and get right to it. So I have a part here, and I'm going to start with a pretty simple example. This is an expansion chamber. If any of you guys have ever worked in um, in Steam or uh, pneumatic systems, you may have seen something like this. And I'm just going to cut it in half using a section view. And you can see that these parts, you know, basically this is just a, a simple chamber that reduces pressure inside of a system by expanding volume. And these are a very simple port shape, but you can see that there is some complexity along here. You've got some undercutting over here. You generally have some undercutting over on this side. What you want to do when you do a chamber like these out of a solid piece of material is end up with a nice, smooth toolpath that comes in and as it machines, you know, it really tilts in to get underneath these. You also see similar toolpaths used or cylinder heads, or any sort of uh, fluid transfer manifolds, things, things like that. So not that unusual. Of course, making these toolpaths can often be a little bit tricky, and that's what we're gonna be working on here. So I'm gonna start out by deleting this toolpath, because it wouldn't be any fun if we started with the answer, right? So let's talk about how to machine this. Now, again, I'm gonna be working mostly in a section view here, but I'll be toggling back and forth just because it's a little easier to see through. And actually, let me just put some caps on to make it a little, <laughs> a little more obvious. So if I were machining this, coming in from the top up here, I would want to have nice, consistent step downs. I'd really want, in an ideal world, I'd be using a 3D waterline toolpath, just basically a, a constant Z step down. Um, there's no need to be any trickier than that with a part like this. We can't do that. We have to undercut. So we have to use a multi-axis pattern. So I'm going to come up here to my toolpaths and I'm going to start with a parallel toolpath. Now I'm going to cheat a little bit because I already have my tool defined, but you can see that there's nothing too special here. It's just a, uh, this, this part is in inches, so it's a one inch lollipop. And we do have a holder defined for it with a, a set amount of stick out. One thing I will say that is very important if you're going to be relying on the automatic tilting strategy is that you really want to make sure that you define your holder properly. You get your stick out amount correct, your tool projection. You really want that to be pretty accurate because <clears throat> the toolpath, the algorithm, is going to be avoiding that for the collision. I mean, it's going to be using the whole assembly to avoid colliding with the wall. So you want to make sure that's accurate. Excuse me. <clears throat> now, on the cut pattern page, we have a couple of choices here. Parallel means that you're going to be taking a single shape and offsetting that through the part, kind of propagating that through the part. Now, we could choose a curve or we could choose a surface, but in this case, we just want to be parallel to an angle, and we really want to do a constant Z. So I'm just going to hit that button here. For our drive surfaces, um, I mean, yeah, this is a solid, but you know, the, the terminology says drive surface. I just wanna make sure that all of my green is selected. Now I could come through here and click, 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 but you know, I don't, first of all, that takes a lot of effort and I don't wanna put a lot of effort into selecting this. Second of all, um, you're likely to miss a little bit. So I'm gonna come over here and use my quick masks and I'm gonna tell it I wanna select all by color. When that dialog opens up, I'm just going to choose my green ones right here and green check. So there we go. Now we can set a bunch of options in here about, um, you know, our tolerance and our step over. And of course, this is going to, this will be based on your 
surface quality and everything. I'm just going to set things a little bit large, just so that way it generates quickly and everybody kind of gets the understanding of what we're doing. Uh, I will be using a spiral method to go down. Now, in this case, I don't need to worry about round corners, extending, any of that stuff. What we are going to be looking at in a minute is our tool axis control page and our collision control page. But for the most part, when you first make a tool path like this, I always recommend that you just focus on getting your cut pattern right. By default, we have the collision control set to trim in case of a gouge or anything. For the sake of walking through the tool path, we're going to turn that off. I don't care about gouges. I don't care whether my tool axis control is correct yet. I want to make sure that my pattern is right. So we're going to generate that toolpath right now. Um, so let's, again, just quick go to our section view. And look at that. That is a, a beautiful toolpath, exactly like what I'd hoped it would be. So now let's backplot this and see what we're going to get. I'm going to switch my view to translucent so we can kind of see through the part. And as I backplot, well, that's a good pattern, but... Uh, <laughs> the machinist probably isn't going to be very happy when we send this down. And that looks like a pretty costly bill. So obviously our tool axis control is not correct yet. Now, the important thing here, though, is to look and see that these blue lines are doing exactly what you want. Because if there were something in here, maybe a hole or a gap of other sorts, or maybe there is a sharp corner, and we weren't happy with how it was handling that, you're not gonna be able to fix that by correcting the tool axis control. A gouge you might be able to fix with collision control, but for the most part, if you're not happy with this here, you need to fix it on the cut pattern page. I'm happy with it, so we're gonna move on. Looking here, looking at the next thing on our tree, we're looking at tool axis control. In this case, what I really, really would like out of this, like I mentioned before, is I'd like it to be a three axis toolpath. Now, of course, we can't do that because of the undercuts on this side and that side. But in an ideal world, I'd only really be using five axis when I wanted to look cool, but also just to kind of tilt the absolute minimum amount needed to clear the part. So I'm going to start my thought process here with how can I make this into basically a three axis toolpath that can still tilt. That's gonna be done on the tool axis control page. So let's go back to the parameters here. I'm on tool axis control over in my tree and I'm going to leave this on five axis. But right now, as you saw, the tool is always being pointed right at the surface and it's got zero amount of tilt right at it. So I'm gonna switch this now instead of telling it that I want to be looking at the surface, I'm going to tell it that I want to do a fixed angle to an axis. And what that means is I'm basically locking it to an axis. And in this case, because of the alignment of my part, uh, if you can see my gnome, um, that axis is going to be the Z. So I'm just going to hit OK. I don't need to change anything else here. Again, we're starting with a pretty, pretty simple example to go over the concepts. But you can see from my nomen that my Z is right there. And if we display the top, you know, we're aligned to that. So now let's backplot this toolpath again. So there we go. That's looking a whole lot better. Now we've got the, the tool lined up properly. It's coming into the port nicely. Um, that's probably not a whole lot better. Let's go back to solid view and make sure that you see what's going on there. Okay, so we've got kind of the basic alignment correct. We're looking at the, the right way, the right general direction, but of course those undercuts are really hurting us here. But that's okay. Now we've got the cut pattern correct. We know that the tool axis control is correct. So now let's use the collision control to get us out of trouble. So back to the parameters we go. And I'm going to make sure that, or I'm going to set my collision control here. And in this case, the one that I'm 
you know, that I really care about, that I know is a problem, is that I need to tilt away. And you can see you have a couple of defaults here. We either have uh, collision control number one, two. For anybody who's never worked with the multi-axis toolpaths, you have a lot of control on this collision control page. But the important thing to remember is that these are applied sequentially. So it's going to run through the calculation and it's going to do the uh, whatever is in number one first. Um, so in this case, we only really need one strategy. And we could set everything to say, I want to look at my flute, my shoulder, my shank, my holder. I want to make sure it's all safe. Um, or you could look at this. The other, the other thing you could do is with a lollipop, you often don't have to check the flute because it's a ball. You know that the ball is not going to gouge. But so what we want to do, though, is we don't want to just trim it out if this is going to gouge. Right now, this is in three axis mode. And of course, it's gouging over here and it's gouging over here along that wall. Trimming it won't help. So what we want to do is to change it to tilt the tool. And how do we want to tilt it? We want to do it automatically. Yep, that's that's exactly what the purpose of this webinar is about. So we're going to leave that on automatic. The only other thing we really want to focus on at this point is these clearances and whether they're good enough to, um, to clear the part as we work down. And in this case, again, we're working in inches, so we're saying 10 thou around the, the shoulder, 25 thou around the shank, and 100 thou around the holder itself. So I'm going to green check out. We're going to generate that toolpath. And while this is generating, uh, German had a question, which is, what if the holder is not in your library? Well, of course, you could always create a new holder um, right in there. Just right click, choose create holder and, um, you know, define it right on the right in. Right as you go, go grab your calipers, go, go grab the holder and, and measure it up. All right. Now, notice. We're back to here. Notice that as we're going down through this, the, calcula the calculation time is getting a little larger because we're asking the computer to do a lot more work at every step here. So that is to be expected. So let's take a look at this toolpath now. So as we come in, we're spiraling down around like we did before. But this time, I'm just going to look at this straight from the front. and I'm going to slow it down a little bit. Just hit play. Notice what's happening, where it can be vertical, it's staying vertical, and it's transitioning into the maximum amount of tilt that it needs to undercut right around that hook. And it's giving us the amount of clearance that we asked. Remember, this is a pretty large part, but asking for 10 thou of clearance is giving me exactly 10 thou of clearance. So when you're undercutting like this, you do have to be careful to give it some clearance, but not enough that it need, would need to tilt to the back and maybe hit the backside of it. So with that, let's let it go down. And you're going to see that it, as it comes down here, now we're going to transition and, and tilt the other way. Now, one thing that happens when you start working with these multi-axis toolpaths, so look at your minimum tilt coming in right through there. Beautiful. All right. One thing that happens when you start looking at these multi-axis toolpaths, a lot of people initially will say, well, why did my toolpath go from being a, a nice, even horizontal slice to having these vertical moves inside of there? And is that bad? Remember that when you're back plotting, you're showing exactly what the very tip center of the ball is doing. So if you're kind of having trouble visualizing what's happening there, I'm just going to copy this toolpath and paste it down. One thing you could do to kind of help figure out what the tool is doing is come down to the miscellaneous page and change your tip comp from tip to center. Now, definitely don't send this out to your machine if your tool is set up to the center. But for visualization purposes, this is a really good exercise. Um, it is going to have to reprocess the toolpath, of course. So we can. We can take a look here at our multi-threading manifold. Well, by the time I got it open there, it uh, it was already done. 
but if you see what's happening, you're still getting these vertical rises, but it's a little less severe than it is when you're looking at the tip. And now when we back plot, you can see this is what the center of the tool is doing because the important thing for it is to maintain your contact point. And as you tip the tool, of course, the, the path that the tool travels on has to go up a little bit because if you look at your position here and where it's contacting the part versus over here, the ball of the tool is in, you know, the, the tip center, everything has to change because you're contacting now on the back side of the tool versus down here where you're going to be cutting more on the bottom. Let's get over to maybe right here. So of course the line relative to the tool itself it is kind of shifting based on the contact point. So that's, that's what's happening there. Um, so with that, is there any questions on what we went over here? When would you ever compensate for the center of the tool? Uh, that's a great question. So depending on your machine, your configuration and your control, there is a lot of people that still have to output to the center of the tool. If your machine does not have what's called TCPC or a tool center point control, um, there's also, there's, <laughs> there's about 10 different ways to brand that. Um, but if your tool, if your machine cannot compensate from the center to the tip when it's tilting, you may have to set up your tool so the zero of the tool, if you bring that tool to Z zero, it's actually at the center of the ball. It's not so much a problem anymore, but back in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, that was the way that you had to program a lot of multi-axis things. Um, and then the, the question is, is it possible to keep the tool path to be horizontal all the time? No, it, it's absolutely not. There is no way that you can cut this and keep the tool itself from moving in the Z. Um, in fact, you would not want to. What's happening is the actual passes, um, the passes themselves, the contact point of the tool is going to be relatively horizontal, especially in cases like this, because where you're contacting this wall at will be near the, the middle. But of course, as you roll backwards, the tool itself has to shift to try and keep that scallop, that contact point, relatively flat so it's you know especially when you look at what the tip is doing the tips moving quite a bit to try and keep the cut itself flat and the other question is do we support cutter comp in 3d mode yes with an asterisk <laughs> um, all of these toolpaths have the data for everything you need for cutter comp inside of them um, any of these surface toolpaths will have the uh, the position of the tool tip, the vector of the tool at that position, as well as the surface contact point and the normal at that position. It's up to your, you, it's Umakant over there, so he, he's a reseller for anybody who doesn't, who, who doesn't know Umakant. Um, so it's up to you as a reseller or your host provider to enable 3D output if you, you know, if you can support it. All right, let's move on to the next example. You're welcome, sir. Now, I, I know a lot of you guys joined me in my last webinar about the uh, formula SAE upright. But for those who haven't seen this part before, this was done uh, in our application shop as part of a support effort for these guys. Um, we sponsor a couple of different Formula SAE, which is a college program that focuses on the engineering of a formula car. So basically there's a defined formula for wheelbase. Uh, there's some engine specs. There's some other things that make this kind of a standard series. But every two years, the colleges that work in this program have to completely build a new car from scratch and they have to design the suspension and they have to design all of the engine mounting and they have to take care of engine control 
So it's an excellent, excellent program for building our future engineers to design things that are actually serviceable and useful, which is awesome. Now, one of the things that we do as a title sponsor is to help them when they have a machining problem that they can't figure out how to machine. Maybe they've designed a part that they know would work great, but they don't have the capability or the experience to machine it. This is one of those parts. The part that I'm about to show you, I don't have a, a good, good picture of the part itself finished, but for anybody who's worked with cars, what we're gonna be working with is the, um, what's called the upright, and that's the part that the hub, the thing that the wheel bolts to kind of slides into. So if you could imagine on, oops. Sorry, trying to get back to the original picture here. Uh, whoops. So this would be mounted. This is what these control arms are mounted to, top, bottom, and of course the steering. So let's just look at the part itself. So in this case, you can see the brakes uh, would be mounted here. You've got your control arms mounting up here. And then there'd be a tie rod for the uh, for the steering. And then, of course, the wheel hub would go through here and there would be bearings inside of it. So this is a really cool part. Um, you can tell that these guys did a lot of finite element analysis to kind of arrive at this shape. So last time we used the port expert toolpath to really easily create a rest roughing machining pass to remove material in this because when we start out you know this was what the three axis roughing toolpath left us so after we've gone through now um, we went through with a five axis machining and we roughed it out near size we're going to put a finishing toolpath on now of course i could use the port expert toolpath and it would work exceptionally well but that's not the purpose of this webinar so let's talk about another way to solve it and it's going to be remarkably similar to what i just did so i'm not going to spend as much time going through every single step in this case though what i want to do is use a morph that goes from this shape to this shape to machine these orange solid faces so i'm going to choose a morph toolpath again i've got a uh, lollipop here and we're working in working in inches yet again. So we've got a lollipop and, you know, we've got a shrink fit tool holder. So um, German, uh, if you wanted to, here's where you could hit new holder and just create one. We, we have one that fit ours, a cat 40. So we're going to go down cut pattern. I'm going to say I want to go. So for anybody who hasn't used morph before, Morph takes one shape and it blends across your surfaces to another shape. So in this case, I'm going to be blending from this curve right here to this curve right back here. And then the drive surfaces, the surfaces I want the pattern on are these orange ones. Again, I'm going to just use my select all colors. And again, I don't care too much about most of these settings. The step over should be fine. I am gonna change it into a spiral though. Once again, I'm gonna ignore the tool axis control. I'm gonna go to collision control and just turn it off for a minute. So when we take a look at this toolpath, and this one takes a minute to generate. Again, our tool motion is not set up yet, but the, the actual pattern looks pretty close to what I'd want. Obviously for a finishing pass, I'd probably want it to be a little finer and higher tolerance, but you guys get the idea. All right, so we're gonna be setting up the same way that we set before. The only trick here is if we look at our planes, you could see that our X is what we want to align to, however, we don't want to align to our positive X. So that's the only trick for this section. Tool axis control. I'm gonna say that I wanna do a fixed angle to axis again along the X. And instead of being right at X zero, which we know would be out this direction to the right, 
we're going to want to be 180 degrees for the x. So that should give us our aligned but gouging on the undercut toolpath. So we'll just backplot that real quick. Yep, that's pretty much pretty much what we thought it would be. Yep, gouging through there. And of course, now we're just going to rely on the automatic um, tilting in collision control. So, you know, again, when you're using round lollipops, you often don't have to check the flute because the flute itself won't be hitting into the part or anything. And that could save a little bit of calculation time. But the important part here is to do tilt tool and automatic. The other thing I want to do for this one is to make sure I include some check surfaces. Now we've painted these in uh, in green previously, so I'm just going to include those as my check surfaces. And depending on how tight you want it to get, you might want to tighten up your clearances and everything. I'm just going to hit OK and we're going to see what we get. All right, multi-threading, and again, we're going to watch, you know, that, that calculation time is going to increase the more we rely on collision detection. Unsurprisingly, we're asking the computer to do a lot of math there. So here we go. Now that's looking pretty good all the way down through here. That's pretty much the best you could hope for to get a, to get a, We'll path on a part like this with a minimum diameter lollipop. So that's working out pretty good. The biggest complaint I would have about this toolpath is the linking motion at the very end where the clearance, retracting the clearance is not very elegant. Um, and then of course the approach, the same thing, just kind of plunging in there is not, not really a great idea. So I'm going to set this up with some nicer linking motion. Let's take a look at that for anyone who hasn't played with these. Basically, the linking page here on these multi-axis toolpaths, if you haven't seen these before, they're controlling how you enter and exit the part and then what to do when you hit a gap. So there's two different gap handlings. If you have a small gap, and the small gap is 100% of the tool diameter or less, and of course, you could type in any number you want in here. Um, it's going to do a blend spline. If it's larger than that, it's going to retract out to the clearance area. Now, in my case, there's gaps or clearances or anything at all. So I'm honestly not too worried about what these settings are. All I really care about is how it's going to um, get to the part and how it's going to get out of the part. In both cases, the approach really isn't that awful. It's just that I don't want it to plunge right onto the part and stop. So all I really want to do is change it. Instead of just approaching from the clearance area and not using a lead in, I really just want to use a lead in, and I want to use a lead out. So let's take a look at that. When I did that, it's now expanded all of my options, and there's a lot of them, but the most important thing here is that I want to use my, I want to edit my default lead in and lead outs. So basically at this point it's saying, this is the default. If I have to lead in and lead out, this is what I'm going to do, unless you specifically override it. And a tangential arc is what I want. I just need a little bit smaller, because 200% of the tool diameter would make a very big arc, and of course I can't do that. So I'm just gonna change this right here, and the same thing here. Of course, I could have just changed it here and then hit the, the copy button. So let's green check out. And while that's processing, um, so the, the while this is processing, I'm gonna answer a question from Anderson, which is how do you know which areas to make check surfaces since you don't have the check surfaces going all the way around? And you're absolutely correct. I didn't like continue over here or really even over here. Um, 
I mean, the, the most obvious way to know what you want to include as a check surface is just to look at what you get and what surfaces is it going to gouge on. Um, and I'll take a closer look at that in just a second for you. But basically, when it was fixed to three axis, when it was aligned to that X, um, I was able to see that it could potentially hit the radius leading into the port. Obviously, it was plunging right through all of these. Um, sorry through all of these guys. So really that's uh, that that's really the the biggest thing as I was looking at what could I hit and I chose that. When I came in from here, you could see that there's no undercut at all to anything out here. So there really was no concern about hitting that because I wasn't going to I wasn't going to violate that. You could absolutely just select the entire model or even a large section over here. But just keep in mind that anything you select for collision control is going to have a direct result on your processing time. And uh, John's asking, what would make you choose a morph over port expert? Because I don't, maybe I don't own port expert would be the reason. Honestly, I'd, I'd just do port expert. And as, as if you attended the, uh, the last webinar, port expert makes this really easy. Uh, the same, honestly, the, the last example was the same. Um, port expert would have made that expansion chamber super simple as well. But, you know, got to show some different ways to do it. So here we see we, we've now added a little bit of lead in, lead out. Um, and that linking, you know, that gets the linking up off the floor a little bit. All right. So for my... I think that's about all I wanted to show you for something like this. And um, just to get away from this fixating on ports idea, I want to show you another part that is not something that could be solved by Port Expert. So this is a simple, simple bracket. Um, I've seen cages like this around um, certain connections and manifolds, um, basically to protect the lines running through it. And of course, inevitably, when you're doing something like this, you're working in some sort of aerospace confined, um, confined area that it's always some weird shape that you're undercutting around. Oh, Adam asked, why did the parallel path not need check surfaces? Because with the, uh, the parallel path on the expansion chamber, the very first one we did, um, that one was really only gouging against the drive surfaces. So there was no chance of hitting that flat face because that flat face was you know, perpendicular to where we were cutting. So basically, if you weren't gonna gouge the drive surfaces, you absolutely were not gonna gouge the, uh, the flat areas around it. So back to this one. Um, so the problem that you have when you're machining these things is trying to clean out like these floor areas, getting a good finish on things like that. This is a classic problem that has, you know, stymied a lot of people. It, it, it caused a lot of people to be very confused how to attack something like that. Because of course, trying to hit it in three axis isn't gonna be very good. You could maybe position it and get this much of it, but then you'd have to do another position to maybe get in there and try and, and finish under here but you're still gonna be a tight pinch right at this kind of area. So even though you could machine out these corners in the center, it really, you know, it'd be difficult to do. So the, the classic way of solving this with a multi-axis toolpath, and I'm not gonna walk you through creating these toolpaths from scratch because you kind of saw that from here, but I will walk you through how I set up these toolpaths. So what I have here, oops, um, I have a morph I'm um, going, I'm just selecting directly off the solid. So I chose from that edge, that straight edge to this rounded edge. I'm driving just off of the, uh, the green surface here. Um, my tool axis control. This is where most people would try to do something like create a chain. So let me cancel out of here. So, the common thought process is I'm going to force this toolpath to do exactly what I want. I'm going to tell it how I want to tilt 
from where to where kind of thing. So what you might do is you might take, say, this upper edge and create a chain there and then kind of move it out into the middle. And then you tell your toolpath, well, I want you just to tilt through this chain. So let's take a look at what that would look like. So you'd start out here, because <clears throat> that's where our pattern starts on the back end, and you'd start at the end of this chain. And that makes sense. And as you come around, you can see that you're, you're tilting upwards, because that's the way the chain says. And from any point on this toolpath, you're just basically drawing a line from this toolpath point to the point on the chain. So that's all fine, well, and good. And you know what that's going to result in is a little bit of surface finish difference as the tool kind of rocks back and forth going around there. But you know that's okay. As we come around, this one's looking all right. But as we start to get to this undercut now, you can really see here we've transitioned to cutting right at the tip, and now we're transitioning over here. And then things start getting weird as we get into this pocket. Well, just because of the nature of the toolpath, maybe the chain isn't perfect and we didn't want to spend a ton of time cleaning it up, fixing it, whatever, there's a bit of a gouge here. So the beautiful thing about these toolpaths is that if you turn on collision control, they say, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not going to allow you to create a gouge position, so we're just going to trim it off. Well, that's great, but now you start out your chain a little late, and where's it tilting from? It's getting kind of ugly. Boom, boom. So, you know, there's some weirdness that happens as we transition around kind of the pivot of the chain and we're getting under here. So this is another prime example of where doing that fixed angle to axis and then just telling it to automatically tilt works really, really well. So that's my second example toolpath here. Um, so if we look at these guys, um, same exact toolpath, I copy pasted everything. The only difference is I changed my tool axis control to fixed angle to axis. In this case, it's lined up to the Z. You guys by now understand what to do there. And um, for this one, we're just telling it tilt away for check surfaces. And of course, I just chose the red as the check surfaces. I did not choose any of the top flat faces, although I absolutely could. It just would not have changed anything because there's no chance of this tool trying to shove a large ball mill that's significantly longer than the, than the height that we need. There's no chance of that gouging along the top. All right, so let's take a look at how this thing looks comparatively. I'm just going to slow this down a little bit and hit play. So now when we come in and we do this, we're staying perfectly vertical. There's really no need to tilt there. And as we come in around, we're, we're cutting we're coming underneath. And the question is, why, why did I have a second collision control? Honestly, I probably just forgot to turn off the first one. I set up the defaults a few years ago just to automatically give me a, um, a trim and relink just in case the tool tip gouges against anything, just trim it out. Um, and then the second one is already set to tilt tool automatic. So I was probably just lazy and just turned that on and used it. Won't hurt anything. But great question. So here you could see it's tilting as much as necessary and not any more. But this is where you could see the failure of the chain method if you're trying to really control it. When you're down here to avoid gouging against this thing, the chain really needs to be all the way back here. But of course, when you're on this end where we're basically vertical, the chain really needs to be over here. And there's no way to do that with a chain. You could spend a ton of time massaging it and trying to get something that would sort of be kind of okay, or just tell it to automatically tilt away and, you know, it, it solves the problem for you. Now, um, we've had some other questions here that I'm going to answer them. Um, will any of the example files we show be available for download? Yes. Um, they Generally, I think the Friday after the webinars, they get these up on the uh, tech exchange and they send an email to everybody who registered. You'll be able to download these guys. So they'll be there. 
Um, can you show us how to finish the red curved surface as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we can we can take a look at that. Um, for proper finish, just because of this undercut radius, I'd I'd say that we need to do a uh, we need to use a lollipop probably to do it. So basically, we could look at this. And we figure out okay, what pattern do we really want? Do we do we want to do just a parallel cut from the top down? Or do we want to morph down to the bottom? I'd say that morph is probably going to be our better choice just because with these uh, large radius fillets in here, um, it's not a consistent, you know, top down. If we look at this from, I'm just going to look at it from the side view and let's uh, section over maybe the right side. Eh, I guess you can't really see anything there. Maybe if we make it translucent, yeah, okay, that's that's a little better. So you see what I'm talking about? We can't just offset from the top down being parallel to that. You'd end up with a pass that just kind of ends here and you'd be trying to play there. So I'd say morph is probably our, our better choice here. Um, so yeah, let's set up a morph toolpath. We'll just do it live and see what happens. Um, oh, one thing I do need to do, I'm going to cancel out of that before I do it. And let's just take a look at my fillets. So, do, 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 do. there we go. All right, so this guy's uh, 10 millimeters. Okay, so now I know, now I know what my upper limit um, radius is for my lollipop. And honestly, doing parts like this, the, the hardest part is figuring out what tooling you should use. So let's go with the lollipop. Uh, I know I could go up to 20, so I'm going to back it off a little bit. Maybe do 18 or even a 16 mil uh, cutting length, 16, no, 14. You know, no need to be too, too super exact here. Uh, 75 shoulder height. I'm just going to leave this stuff all default. You, you know, obviously, you, you could play around with this this kind of thing to uh, get it more lined up with your tooling. Overall length 200, sure. Finish. And holder. Um, I don't know. Something like that, sure. Let's try 150 millimeters to stick out. I don't know if this will be, you know, I don't know if this is going to work or not. We may, <laughs> but we're just playing around. So. Uh, I'm going to say I want to cut pattern from, and I'm going to choose solid chaining because I don't have any any sort of chain. And now what I'm using here is the X key on my keyboard, which is the um, the same thing as hitting this next button. If I needed to, I could hit the um, the J key for adjust if I wanted it to go a different direction, but of course I don't. There we go. So we got that, and we're going to morph down to this one. Okay. And my drive is going to be all of these red. All right. So following my normal procedure here, um, I'm going to I'm going to dial back my step over a little bit. I'm going to set it to a spiral and then I'm going to come to my tool axis control. Now, remember that this stuff's all filled in because I already have these morph tool pads. So I'm going to have to manually set them back to what they were, which is surface with tilt. I could also, of course, come up and hit reload from defaults, but I, I don't really want to do that. And I'm going to turn off my collision control. So let's generate that tool path. All right. Of course, we know already that the, the tool is going to be normal to the surface. We, we've already figured that one out. But what I'm curious about is, is this the correct pattern? Yes, it is, but I would prefer, when if I were machining these, I'd probably prefer to just keep the tool down and machine this as if it were solid. Um, of course, you could retract off and move to clearance as we are now. You could lift off a little bit and do it at a feed. There's a ton of different strategies you could use here. I'm just gonna choose one. I'm gonna tell it to keep the tool down. So in this case, the problem that we have is we have a large gap 
And how large is that gap? I'm not exactly sure. Let's just uh, head over here to analyze the distance. And I'm guessing that this is probably the widest. So maybe we'll say from here to here. And we know that that's 75 millimeters. All right, so before I even work on collision control and my tool axis control, I'm gonna fix my linking because I wanna make sure that my blue lines are all correct all the time. So I don't really care about the approach or retract. You guys have already seen that. What I care about here is what we're doing during these gaps. So we see that if anything is less than 200% of my tool diameter, so my, my tool diameter right now is 16 millimeters. So if we're less than 200% of that, stay down, just go direct, literally from this point to that point. If it's larger than that, we want to retract to the clearance area. Now, we could just say, make our large gaps also direct. So it doesn't matter if it's bigger than, if it's smaller than 200, go direct. If it's larger, go direct. And that works perfectly fine. You know, we could generate the toolpath there and see what we get. So, yeah, that's more like what we were kind of talking about there. Um, the other thing we can do is leave this at the retract to clearance area. So that way, when there are really big gaps, it still has to pick up and, and wrap it over. And we could just say, hey, if it's, um, if the gap is larger than, I don't know, 90, oops, then go direct and otherwise retract to clearance. And another thing you could have it do is do a blend spline. In this case, it's not gonna help us too much. These are nice flat walls. We're just gradually transitioning down. Direct should be fine. When I'm doing blowing surfaces, I, I prefer to, uh, to do blend splines because it kind of gives you a, a nicer sweep across that. Um, the other thing I'd like to do is just make sure that I'm using an automatic clearance. So I'll just choose that. So I don't have to specify anything. This is an old file that was before automatic clearance was a thing. So let's see what we got here. All right. So we're getting a little bit of noise here. That gap, the just because the way the tool is tilting, the, the gap is still a little bigger there. So maybe I'm just going to say here, um, any just blend anything that's smaller than 150 millimeters. Again, for this part, it doesn't, doesn't really matter because it's such a simple shape, a simple concept that you can dial that all the way up. Um, you know, so set it, set it however you're happy, how, whatever you'd like to do, retract to clearance, set them both to direct, follow surface, you know, it, it doesn't really matter for this particular case. So we'll just say everything direct, keep it down. But like I said, I, I generally like to force this as a small gap and the other one as a major clearance. That'll keep it. That that still gives you another out. All right. So now let's let's backplot this. I know I've got a little bit more I could clean up on my linking, but that's okay. This kind of gets me gets me close enough. Of course, my lead in and lead outs are are not very happy here. That's all right. The most the thing that I care most about is what are we doing all the way around. So this would be another prime time to kick on fixed angle to axis. Oops, so, so tool axis control. Oops, tool axis control. Fixed angle to axis. It's going to be to the Z. And we're going to jump right ahead here and turn on our tilting tool automatic against our drive surfaces. And um, that should be good enough. I shouldn't need check surfaces in this case. Again, it's not likely that we're going to hit the, the top gray. Of course, I could choose the entire model as part of my check to avoid. But we'll just take a quick look and, and see if my tool is long enough to avoid hitting and everything. All right, so now that we've got our orientation correct here, spiraling around and you see we're tilting nicely underneath that. And still could play with our gap settings a little bit, but all right. So 
Just looking at the time, I think that's about as far as I'm going to take that now. Adam, does that help you out a bit? All right. Um, now, another thing you could do, of course, just, you know, <laughs> there's I can think of about 50 ways to do this differently. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you guys can as well. But, you know, one thing you would absolutely be able to do would be to finish these these three walls with more of like a swarf kind of idea and then only do a simultaneous five axis machine on the front. That'd be another option breaking it up. Um, yeah. But so then the the other questions that are coming in are all about collision control. And these are great. And I'm hoping to do a more in-depth uh, dive into these later. But the question is, why do you have more than one collision control? Because what what do you want to happen? Like, well, how, do, how do these interact? And it turns out if you look through the menus, you actually have four total collision control strategies. And these can absolutely be overwhelming and confusing. So I generally suggest only using one, maybe two. But what happens is when you apply one, it's going to use that first. It's going to calculate the tool path. It's going to take your cut pattern and it's going to take your tool axis control. And it's going to look at those and go, okay, here's my raw tool path. Now let's look at the collision control, whatever you have set up in, op in, in setting number one, and it's going to do that to the tool path. You may want number one to say, oh, I'd like to retract the tool if it's going to gouge um, along the tool axis. Sorry, just had a, uh, a two-year-old come down to join me. <laughs> the joys of working at home, huh? Um, and then after that... All right, um, and then what you could do is you could have it say something like, you know, retract the tool uh, along the Z plus or maybe along the XY plane and then have it tilt. Or you could have it do something like tilt and then uh, retract if it can't if it can't do that. Or you could, I mean, there's honestly, there's thousands of possibilities um, where you would want different options to come into play. And it's one of those things that it's easy to understand if I have the examples handy and we run through them all, but based on the time, um, you know, I, I, your guys' time is very valuable and I don't want to make this webinar run really long in this case, but I would absolutely love to do kind of a deep dive into this and how tolerance is affected and things like that. But basically, to sum it up as concisely as I can, if you have a very specific set of behavior, you need something to follow. I need it to retract along the X and then I need it to trim if that's not going to be good enough. That's where you use multiple collision control strategies. And like I said, it is a lot clearer if I have the examples handy, but it would take me longer than the five minutes I have left um, to, to get the examples all ready to go. And I don't want you guys to have to waste your time watching me fumble around getting those ready to roll. In a case like this or the other two examples that I've shown you today, there's no need to use two. Okay. Automatic tilting solves your problem. And honestly, since automatic tilting came around um, about five years ago, four years ago, it solves 90 plus percent of my problem. It's very rare that I need a, a second tool axis control in day-to-day -day usage. Well, great. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day or a great evening, depending on where you're at in the world. Cheers.